Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan, and Drew Galloway here with you. Wrapping up the Wildcats' loss in Austin, 33-30 to the final score. K-State goes down in overtime to Texas. Texas now in the driver's seat to the Big 12 title game with Oklahoma State, which we'll talk about that at the end of the show based on how the Big 12 is starting to sort itself out. And K-State falls to 6-3 and three overall, 4-2 and two in the Big 12 with three games left this year. It was a game that was away from K-State. They had no shot, and then all of a sudden, in a very quick time span, late in the third quarter, start of the fourth quarter, they all of a sudden not only had life, but looked like they might really come back and get this thing done. And they, I mean, they, they came so close. They had many chances. They made many mistakes, and they still had chances, and then just a few more errors at the end. So K-State falls short against Texas, and uh, we can just start with some of the immediate takeaways from the loss for the Wildcats. Drew, I'll let you lead off here. What uh, are some of the things that immediately come to mind for you? Uh, I mean, honestly, like the this was a hard game to have immediate takeaways for because it felt like it was two separate games. Uh, I think my biggest immediate takeaway is that that's probably the best Will Howard has played in his entire career. I think that's a career high for passing yards, tied to school record for passing touchdowns, which, by the way, nobody can beat four. There's like 15 guys now that are tied with four uh, in one game. Uh, but, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, you kind of probably regret not throwing soon enough. I mean, it was something that we kind of all anticipated Casey would have to throw but they probably stuck with the run game a little too much or just weren't diverse enough with the run game. But, I mean, you got to win the line of scrimmage. And when you're not winning the line of scrimmage, you got to air it out. And they probably didn't air it out soon enough. Yeah, I, 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 I'll get to that. I, I, I will say if, if you would have told me before the game, K-State's going to rush for 60 yards on 24 run calls with a 16% success rate, I would have said, well, Texas is going to win by three touchdowns at least. And it kind of looked like they were going to do that for a while. But you're, you're, you're right, the passing game did come together. And the only thing I'll say is through the, I think, first five drives, maybe six drives, K-State did call 10 passes and gained five yards. So – it was not pretty early in any phase of the game. The pass game struggled. The run game struggled. Um, I think what Avery Johnson got two series there in the in the midst. One series was up three runs and out, and the other series he did throw one ball and he ran it once. So that was that was part of it. But there was just nothing K State could get going um, offensively until that second half, which which we'll get to. But I think you know it's kind of you're you're right. It is this the tale of two games. Uh, the, the first part of the game where K-State really tried to run it and was running it half the time and getting nowhere and really not passing it well either. And then, um, as, as Chris Kleiman kind of talked about in the game, the game kind of flipped with that block punt, and then K-State got the passing game going a little bit after that. So that was, that was to me, the story, and then we'll get into more of the dramatics, I'm sure. I think, you know, when it comes to, uh, like, the the early stuff with did they throw it enough, did they not – I think the the real frustrating point for people probably comes from they threw Avery Johnson in there and then it was immediately, hey, run game's not working, but let's call three straight runs with Avery Johnson and it didn't work. I think that's probably where most of the oh, throw the ball, throw the ball type of stuff came from. Um, because, yeah, I mean, they, they weren't effective early on in a lot of ways and it kind of took, you know, some some flukiness and nice field position uh, in the the second quarter for them to actually get a chance to score and they had to throw the ball and it worked out for them. I, I, I'm with Drew here. It's one of those games where the immediate takeaways, I mean, I think a lot of us had them very immediately at the start of this game. And then they kind of turned out to where if you kept those through the end of the game, you'd be laughed at because it ended up close. But I, I want everybody to know that the like the frustration and the things that you thought through the first half, basically, and really the first three quarters, because they didn't 
start scoring again until the end of the third. None of those are wrong. I mean, everything that they did there, it, it led to a bad game for K-State. It, they played a bad three quarters, but they worked it out. They gave themselves an opportunity in the fourth. They took advantage of Texas and, and some of their errors, and they gave themselves a chance. So, you know, everything that you're upset about, you look a little crazy for freaking out in the moment because it ends up being a 33-30 game, but you're not that far off because you ended up, K-State ended up losing that game because of how putrid they are through basically the first three quarters of the game. So I think that would be my takeaway is that everybody, it seems like you overreacted, but it was all warranted in the end because K-State lost the game that they easily could have won. And they have two of those games this year. Texas and, and Missouri are games you easily could have won. And the Oklahoma State game, I, I don't throw it in the same category because K-State never really had the opportunity to win that game. They should have gone and won that game, and Oklahoma State gave them the window to do so. K-State just never took advantage of it. In the Missouri and Texas games, they did seem to take advantage and just couldn't hang on. So uh, we'll, we'll have plenty to kind of get into here and and – dig in and, and dive from here. Normally we go on to our cause for concern. I mean, after a game like that, where is the cause for concern? Where does it come from? I mean, I, I talked about it with Drew in the instant reaction video. Honestly, my biggest negative takeaway from the game is the defensive line. They, I mean, they, their presence was non-existent today. They didn't get a sack. And, you know, over the last few weeks, the sack thing has has dwindled down, but it's not been my biggest concern. They've still been able to get pressure that that impacted the quarterback. They weren't really able to do that much today. I mean, you got a couple of plays out of Brendan Mott, which was helpful. But also in the run game for Texas, it seemed like the defensive line was able to, you felt like maybe even start to wrap a guy up after he got to the line of scrimmage. And then K-State had guys getting dragged for five, six, seven yards. And I think that's the most frustrating part of the day for me. And and my biggest cause for concern is that I know that Texas is a good team. They've got a good offensive line, but when you were needed most, the defensive line did not show up today. And at some point, one way or another, outside of the running backs, not really their fault, every other position did show up at one point today to help K-State try and come back and win this game. I just felt like the effort and the the, the success from the defensive line was pretty non-existent. So that's probably my biggest concern moving forward, especially considering that KU is still on the schedule and they're one of the better running teams in the Big 12. Uh, with Devin Neal and Daniel Hyshaw. Uh I mean, I, I'd say that, I mean, it's kind of along the same boat, but my, my biggest cause for concern, I think, is uh, the inability to win the line of scrimmage today. Because if you look at the three losses, K-State's gotten beat at the line of scrimmage in all three games pretty handily. And, and like Missouri and Texas, you could say that they have one of the best defensive lines in the country. Oklahoma State's kind of the outlier where – it seems like they've just really figured everything out. So they, that game was just kind of wild on its own. But you look at it, and the three losses, Casey has lost the line of scrimmage. And I, I think kind of how the offense and defensive line goes, that, that that's going to be how K-State goes. And that if you're going to talk about you need to win the line of scrimmage, because that was the, the big theme all throughout this week, is the big theme all throughout uh, the Oklahoma State lead-up, if you're going to put that much emphasis into it, you can't get dominated in the line of scrimmage like you did today. Yeah, I would. I kind of agree with you, Drew. That 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 would be my biggest concern. Um, I I don't know how it factors in with the matchups coming up. Probably the best defensive line we'll face would be Iowa State's. I'm guessing, and then KU's, and then Baylor's. Um, uh, offensive line wise, of course, KU's front and their running game will be very difficult and, and a challenge. So I, I do think that is a legitimate concern. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still shocked by the, the lack of success in the running game. I, I thought Texas would limit us. I did not think they would control it as well as they did. Um, and that, that would probably be just the offensive line getting dominated that badly. Um, would in the run game specifically, I think they, they kind of shored things up enough in the passing game to give us some time as the game went along. But that that inability to run was was not something I expected at all coming into the game. So that would be the biggest thing that that comes out to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There, it's just, we're going to have a lot of moments today <laughs> where we're just at a loss for words and don't know uh, what the next move is. 
Uh, but we'll we'll try and figure it out. All right. Well, we can we can roll on now and start to fully dissect this game. We'll start with the the most important part and the thing that's always a hot topic for people, and that's uh, decisions to or not to go for it. And Chris Kleiman had the opportunity there. K State sat at the Texas four yard line on fourth down, decided to go for it, and. I'm I am okay with his decision. I support it because of a couple of reasons. Number one, the way that overtime is structured in college football right now, I don't. I mean, K State. I, I Will Howard stepped up and made a great play to hit Ben Sennett to get K State down inside the Texas, you know, seven or whatever it was. I just I don't know that Texas was going to let that happen again. Although Will Howard was kind of dicing Texas up the in, the entire second half, but. I don't know that you're going to score a touchdown the second time you get the ball and you're going to need a touchdown to win that game because I just, you're putting it on the defense so much because that two point conversion shootout stuff that I think is really stupid now in college football, that if games get to the third overtime you go to K state didn't have a great chance in that. You think of how Texas ran the ball all day. They were over six yards of carry. And like I said, a minute ago about the defensive line, the defensive line would get that initial contact and then Texas was busting through. I feel confident that Texas would have found a way to easily get in early on in that process. K-State has struggled in those short yardage goal line situations all season. And I think that they would have probably been a little confused and not certain where to go there. So I don't like their chances in that. And then secondly, if you send Chris Tennant out there after he has already missed one like he did from a short distance and you've already had a bad snap, on a kick of short distance today and something bad happens again, Chris Kleiman and the fans, they would never forgive each other for that. Like Chris Kleiman wouldn't forgive himself. Fans wouldn't forgive him. I think he went out there. He was aggressive. He tried to make the play to go out and get the win, kind of riding some of the wrongs. Cause I do think that some of the play calling and, and decision-making early in the game was soft and similar to 2019 Oklahoma state, where it was K state was just coaching to not get beat badly and he was trying to make up for it. I have zero issue with the decision to go for it on fourth down, especially after the opportunity appeared to be there on some of the previous plays in that same situation to score a touchdown in case they just wasn't able to come through. I, I, I agree. I, I don't, I have no issue with going for it. And you know, the way uh, Chris Kleiman talked after the game, he would do it again and again and again. So I think that's just his philosophy. Um, I think, you know, it's one of those philosophies that if it works, everybody thinks you're, you're great if, if it doesn't. Because it's so definitive. Like, it's not like a play in the middle of the game where you, you have a resolute decision you always make to go for it on fourth and one or whatever. So um, I don't mind it, especially as a road team, uh, kind of an underdog situation. I think that plays in the factor. I think, Mason, you, you nailed it with the new overtime rules as well. I think that is not something you want to get into a two-point contest with Texas in, in that, in that, in the, especially in their strengths up front and ours compared to theirs in, in this ball game. So, you know, I know um, the, I do understand the argument some some people have made that our defense had played well the whole game. Their their quarterback was struggling. I, I get that, but you're also flipping where they're gonna you're gonna get the ball first and then they're gonna get to answer you. So you have that dynamic as well. So um, lots of things at play, but I think. This is just Kleiman's MO and what he's going to do. So uh, I, I appreciate if, he, if he's got a philosophy, he's going to stick with it, go for it. As long as he's, he stays consistent with that, I'm, I'm all for it. And also real quick, I mean, the defense had been playing better and getting stops, but it's one of those deals where it shifted and the game had been put into their hands so often that you were just going to give it to them another time. And that burnt K-State at Missouri where – they weren't aggressive. They weren't able to to get that final push that they needed, and they gave the game back to the defense one more time, and it's just too much stress and and opportunities for the Missouri offense to go out there, and they took advantage of it, and they were able to kick that game-winning field goal. I think it's that same type of deal here where you realize, man, it, it's tough to ask this of our defense again and again when Texas has those kind of athletes and, and players. And so I think he also just knew from past experience that – it was best to try and get the win there, and 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 I appreciate it. At some point in the future, you would think that that's probably going to work out for K-State. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't today, and it hasn't in, in some previous situations. Yeah, I mean, Mason, you and I kind of talked about it on the instant reaction. I just 
I, I don't have a problem with it because, uh, it, like, you're at the four-yard line. I think anybody uh, coming into the game, you're like, okay, K-State has three shots from the four-yard line and in to win the game. I think anybody would have gone for it in that situation. It really feels like it looks worse, and I said this in the instant reaction too, where it looks worse where your first three play calls, you were probably half an inch from winning the game, and on fourth down you had no chance. Yeah. Where if that play call is, if that play call is the one where it's like uh, the third down play that the ball might have been a little behind Keegan Johnson, but still probably could have been caught. Are we talking about like should they have gone for it as much as it was just one bad play call where Texas just play, played it pretty well? Uh, because I mean, I mean, you said eventually one time it's going to work out for K State. Well, Houston had the same scenario where in overtime today, Baylor scored first, Houston scores, and then they went for two, and Houston won 25 24. I mean, at, at some point, things like that will work out. And, and like, it, it's one where, I mean, you also said, like, you look like an idiot if it doesn't work, but you look like a genius when it works. And, and I think with this offense, if you give them three plays to get four yards, I think anybody would take that any day of the week. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And I just, it's it's weird to kind of think about, um, I mean, how, how different the conversation is if, if something works out and K-State is able to score there because um, you know, either we avoid this conversation totally or a, the fourth down thing works and we're like, yeah, this is great. Texas was on their heels. You went down and, and put it on them. You know, Chris Kleiman's great and all this. I, I think that one thing is that while people – maybe slightly overreacted in the game, you know, myself included, like everybody overreacted watching that. There were some issues, but they overcame them because at the end of the day, all of these coaches are very good at what they do. And I know that people aren't going to like me saying that because we have, uh, you know, tons of people that say after position grades every week that we need to grade the coaches and everything because they're, they're not satisfied. We're never satisfied with coaching decisions in football because – we all think that we can make them because we've played NCAA football on the Xbox before. Um, and, you know, I've I've certainly called good games. I, I think about this a lot. I critique, like, bullpen decisions in baseball all the time. You know what I do? I make terrible bullpen decisions sometimes in MLB The Show when I'm playing it. It's like, why did, why did I do that? That guy was out of energy. He was struggling. It was a bad matchup. And it's like, I was just being selfish. You know, I wanted to rack up another save for Scott Barlow or something like, and, and you know, me or like my usage of Brad Keller. I'm like, well, you know what? I can lower that ERA if I just get one more inning out of him. And then I end up giving up four runs, you know, Brad's my boy, but it happens. So we all critique these guys. Most of the time we just can't publicly go out and do anything about it and have ourselves proven wrong. Colin Klein for as, as bad. And I think questionable and fair as it is to question how he did things early in the game. Uh, it, it picked up later on, but the one thing we do need to maybe question is the third down and one call that led to the Chris Tennant missed kick and basically rolling over, making the very predictable decision to have Will Howard run the football and not getting it, not having a chance at all. Uh, I'll let Fan fire off here first because he's typically the more level-headed individual out of everybody. Uh, he's also coached a lot more games than we ever have. Uh, what did you make of the decision and anything else that stemmed off of it? Well, I I thought QB run was probably coming at some point. Any Anytime we get the ball inside the 20, I kind of expect so, at some point there's going to be a QB run. I did think in that situation it was it – was, a little bit more predictable, especially when we go empty. I think we had at least one tight end in. We've done QB run on that several times, and, you know, a couple times we've had 30-yard runs on it. So I think, you know, Klein, Klein, Klein was thinking that way, but that was totally stuffed, and Texas did not empty the box at all, even though we went empty. And so really uh, that one had no shot. You know, I thought the one later in the game where we the, – the one on the, the last drive in overtime where we went empty did the same thing, but we, we just kind of motioned DJ out of the backfield that time. 
that was a better look and we had a better push at the line of scrimmage and will had a cutback lane which we all can see now because we have video and we can say well you should have just cut to the right and you would have scored easily probably and maybe that's the case but um that, that the third one call yeah i did that's easy to say hindsight just because it was blown up so bad like it was it, that run had no shot and uh i, I agree I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure what else you do there. Um, K-State wasn't having any success running the ball with the backs either. Um, maybe one of those quick passes in the flat to a running back or a tight end might have been the call there. But uh, obviously it didn't work, so it's easy to say. Um, and it got blown up, so it's easy to say this that was a really bad call and it didn't work out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my probably critique with that would be it, it is pretty – predictable to go QB run there. So maybe you do the jet motion, like read QB yeah. run where you maybe like you at least have two options where that was just straight QB run and that play had zero chance of working. Like it, it was, I, I mean, that's the only thing that I can really think of because like, I mean, with, with an offensive line that has this much experience, you expect them to be able to get a yard on third yeah. one. And, and it, this is where, I mean, I, I've, I've texted my friends this a few times uh, in post game. Being a coach is hard because what, what if they throw there and it's incomplete? Then we're saying, why didn't they QB Ron? Yeah. So like, it, it's it's just hard. And I mean, at some point it just comes down to execution. And I, I think we've we've also run at least two quarterback sneaks this year that we didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fourth and goal from uh, fourth and short from the one yard line, so or not fourth down, but I know from in short yards near the goal line. I know we failed on at least two this year, so I we've been reluctant to run uh, quarterback sneaks this year and really haven't done very well with them. So I think that I think that's in the equation too. Awesome. Yeah, I think they I think they failed failed well they failed one at Oklahoma State. And I think the the other one was – it had a failed one in the Troy game, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those are the two that stick out to me. And just in general, they've struggled a little bit. It's taken some, I mean, more developed and creative plays to score when they get into those short yardage goal-to-go situations, which is why I thought the two-point conversion shootout thing was not a good outcome for K-State if it had to get to that. Uh, I'll throw this out there again uh, because you brought up the two-point conversion shootout, and I was just thinking about the new overtime rules. With the short yardage struggles this year, if you score in the second overtime, you have to go for two. So I wonder if they just wanted to avoid all of that and just go. And they probably they probably ran their, what they thought was their best two-point conversion play from the fourth yard. Yeah, I'm sure they did. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's going to be discussed and talked about a lot all these decisions on short yardage situations and, and everything else so, all right one of the big things that everybody has has already keyed on in on and was hot on early was the the commitment to the run game that clearly was not going to work today in case they had a little success running the football um, it didn't get better as the game wore on and I think maybe that was going to be the hope is that okay you've you've done so much to this point that uh, with throwing the ball that Texas is going to start to think, okay, we can soften up on the run. K-State in the first half, they ran the ball 17 times for a total of 28 yards, so 1.6 yards a carry. In the second half, they ran the ball 12 times for 5 yards, uh, 0.4 yards per carry, for those that were curious on that and, and how that went down. Um, no, nah, that's not good, unfortunately. Um we talked about it a little bit and, and how it went, I think, before the show, but should K-State have abandoned the run game sooner and started to air it out, or were they was that just a classic, like, this is our strength, we got to stay committed to it and give it a little bit more time to see if it'll start to bust through for us? I mean, how, how, how did we think of how K-State played that and the ultimate outcome from it? Yeah, I, I, I think they... I think the one, I think we talked about it earlier. I think the one drive you kind of look back on is when Avery Johnson came in, we ran the ball three straight times with 
um, with Treshawn Ward, I believe. It wasn't even Avery running the ball. No, DJ Giddens. DJ ran it. It was the two back set with uh, with uh, what's his name? Frias. Uh, Frias was in the game. Uh, yeah, real quick. This that is was the, that not, was the, that was the formation we used. I think on at least two of the carries. So yeah, not uh, not me. You know, me trying to be be mean or anything, but for a guy that only got one carry in twenty twenty two and they did not trust to give the ball to again last season. And while I think Anthony Frias has done good while he's out there, it was far too early for Anthony Frias to be getting snaps in in a game where you were already struggling. Like, I don't think that was going to be the key. And maybe, you know, probably inconsequential to how the success of the play went, but that was just another one of those things that you could put on this, you know, notes list that you were taking of Colin Klein and how the, the first half went and being like, that's a pretty questionable decision. What what was that all about right there? Yeah, I mean, it, what what's hard about, and like I, I even said they probably should have air, aired it out a little sooner, but I mean, honestly, the offense wasn't really going in the first half to begin with. So it the, the first half was just a disaster on all levels of offense until the blocked punt, which... By the way, that could have been a blocked punt for to the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably should have been. But at least we scored afterwards. So I mean, True. I mean, I, I think I think one of the bigger takeaways I think from the game, like with the passing game, is that we've we've been waiting for this game from the receivers. Mm-hmm. And, and we've been especially been waiting for this game from Keegan Johnson. Yeah, he had the the bad interception uh drop, which that's hard because that that's one where like if you look back, oh, it's an interception, but that doesn't that shouldn't count against Will. Uh, but yeah. we've been but we've been waiting for this game from Keegan Johnson, and he broke out. Jace Brown had another big game. Philip Brooks had the best play of his career. Vince Bennett was good in the passing game. Like <laughs> we've been waiting on this game for a long time, and, and it's crazy how it all kind of happened in like uh like five minutes of game time, like blur. Well, so uh, thinking about how things kind of played out then with, you know, K-State and this this game, where where do we think if they had come out and just been a little bit more competitive to start and held Texas up, I mean, how much does that actually impact the game there? Because Texas is obviously talented enough in a lot of areas that I'm I'm a little, you know, obviously if K-State had played better to start, it's, it's a good thing. It would have been better for them, but there's – also the chance that like Texas plays that game a lot differently. Cause I think we've seen in a lot of situations, Steve Sarkeesian at Texas, the, the decision-making doesn't always go the best when they have these bigger leads. Like they struggled in Manhattan last year when they got up big, they struggled this year against Houston when they got a big Texas tech. Like they, they make some questionable decisions because I don't know if it's that they get lazy or they think, all right, we're kind of in a good spot. Like, let's try this, let's try that. And, and they get away from what kind of worked for them. I mean, uh, th- this game, I think, is just kind of so fickle with how it, it works sometimes um, that I don't know how impactful, uh, you know, K-State getting off to a, a better start would have been because I think Texas plays things a little bit differently. And, again, I'm not trying to say that, hey, you know, if K-State plays better, maybe it's a bad thing for them. It's just uh, it's it's tough to 100% lock in and, and say that, you know, things don't go differently on the Texas side too. So I think we at least have to – consider that when when looking at things oh yeah uh, sneakily mm-hmm. to that the one of the biggest plays of the game i said in the instant reaction was the the dropped interception because they, they got nine yards on the first play to philip brooks and then will howard threw probably the best pass of his career <laughs> to keegan johnson and it was dropped and it goes right into their texas players hands i mean that that was just the story of how the game was going for the first two and a half maybe two, even three quarters, quarters. And I mean, real quick, I mean, there were a couple of dropped interceptions out there today that you you kind of shake your head at and wish K-State would have had back. The the hands certainly work in progress for the defensive backs at K-State. Yeah, that was the the one in the end zone, you know, that would have taken away three points, I think, for Texas. I think they ended up with a field goal. And then the one at the – 
toward the midfield. I don't I don't remember if they ended up scoring on that one or not. But that is something that is part of that turnover luck stuff that I talk about sometimes is that you sometimes you get lucky on those, sometimes you don't. Um Yeah. We did we did get we did finally get a forced fumble and picked it up and you know we, but we also had the fortune of we fumbled after we picked off one of the balls and we're fortunate to get back on the ball. So, you know, the bounce of a football is a funny thing and, and the, the ability, you know, people, I think it's way cliche to say those guys play defensive back for a reason, but <laughs> sometimes it does look like that. And we saw that at least twice today. Cause those were, those balls looked like they were thrown to us. They weren't even, it wasn't even those guys making yeah. a play on the ball. The ball was thrown right to them. So yeah, unfortunately, Marky Siegel might be the poster child for that saying this year because I didn't feel like over the last four weeks he's had a lot of opportunities and they've just gone whoop right by him. The, the hard part, too, with those Siegel drops is like it feels like he's like half a second from a pick six if he yeah, got yeah. the ball every single time. Well, I mean, what against Tech, TCU, and Texas now? It feels like if he, he grabs it, six. it's six yeah. points. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, Turn, the Jacob Parrish interception turned into a fumble was one of the crazier things that I think I've ever seen. Yeah, boy, that would have felt really bad in that moment had Parrish gotten the pick and then you give Texas the ball back and it's first down for them. Uh, that would have kind of sent people even crazier than they already were. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the defense, look, uh, there are a lot of things to pick out that you can yank your hair out with the defense early in the game and get frustrated about. But it is kind of the same story as the Oklahoma State and Missouri games. I don't think the defense cost K State the game today. And for most of the game, the defense did help them out. The defense kept them in the game, and you kept giving the offense opportunities. And for the first time, really, K State felt like they were taking advantage of it against Texas. It just, you get to overtime, it's basically like a new game starting, and you, you lose some of your control. And they did a great job in overtime to force a kick pretty quickly off of Texas. So the defense, while they had their struggles and I mean, they got burnt early and Texas was just like, yeah, we got bigger, faster, stronger guys. We're going to try and use it. They stepped up later on in the game and I, the linebackers were good today with Clifton and Purnell. I thought stood out quite a bit. Um, Austin Moore got some pressure there towards the end of the game. So they, they, they eventually stepped up and did what they needed to. And so I, you can't pin this as much on them as you initially thought maybe it was going to be. The one thing that I will say infuriated me the most with the defense today was the the sneak that K-State thought was going to happen, and then Texas ends up just taking it to the outside. And look, I know you got to go all in on those sneaks and everything now with the way that they're, they're operated, but what, it looked like K-State only had two guys out there as possible defense. They didn't even seem to act like they knew what was going on there. I think that's that's just poor on Joe Klanderman and his defense to not be better prepared. I know it's still a tough thing to stop, but you just saw the team that is the best in football right now at any level that does this, the Philadelphia Eagles, they ran something similar to that last week where they relentlessly just get what they want, pushing the quarterback up the middle and they get the first down. And last week they said, you know what, we're just going to sneak out here and oh, there goes a guy for a touchdown. And to not be prepared, you have to be alert of those types of things and to not be prepared for that. That was that was pretty disappointing in my books to just get burnt that easy. Yeah, that was a that was a frustrating play. I, I do think we had a guy there to make a tackle and he just missed. Yeah, Siegel was the there tackle. and a lot of just missed. Yeah, so I, I agree. Uh, the, 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 the biggest thing I will say about the defense, um, we held Texas to just over two points per drive and it was their lowest points per drive game of the season. It was also their lowest yardage rate game of the season. So uh, compared to what they had been doing, uh, it was a pretty good game. Now they did, I, th I think it's another game where the explosives kind of hurt us. They were at 6.7 yards per play, which was their fourth best of the season. So uh, they had enough explosive plays um, that, I, that I think that kind of is defensively the thing that caught us the most, that, that run on fourth down being one of them. But a couple other plays over the top to Mitchell were big as well, and we, we got beat badly in coverage on a couple of those too. So the big plays was really kind of the story once again for our defense. 
Um, but, I, but I do think um, the defense did play well enough to, to win that game if the offense just does a little bit better and, and the special teams does a little bit better as well. Texas ends up with six plays of 20 yards or more, uh, and they had two plays that one went for 47, one went for 54, uh, which ends up being you know pretty significant in the game. So tough to, to see how that played out for K-State and just one of those deals uh, where it, it happens. K-State ended up with five plays over 20 yards. So very rarely do you, I think you can look at that and say, oh, that was the that was the difference by that much of a margin. It really was there. I mean, K-State was one other you know play over 20 yards away from maybe it works out in their favor and they get something good to happen. So. Uh, it also makes it like that uh, the two big Texas plays, the 47 and 54 yarder, were both touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yep. that, and, and I think only one of K-State's plays that was 20 or more yards was a touchdown. It was uh, the Brooks one. Yeah, the uh, let's see. So K- K-State ends up with those five. Uh, they had two go for 20 that were touchdowns. They had uh, the 32 yarder to Jace Brown and the 26 yarder to Phillip Brooks. Mm-hmm. Um, that they ended up converting on. So that's those those did work out as touchdowns. But yes, you're right. They and they were more so it's weird because you know Texas had moved the ball outside of those big plays. Yeah. K State it felt like the only way they were moving the ball uh initially was those big plays. So it's just uh, a tough a tough way that things work out. All right. Let's roll on, keep it going here. It's K-State football. We got to talk quarterback. Boy, there were a lot of quarterback takes flying around from all corners of K-State fandom today. Uh, what what do we think of Will Howard's play? Because, look, I it was a slow start, but I think we can look at it and at the end of the day say that the outcome is not on Will Howard in any way. He probably played the best out of anybody for K-State in this game. And everybody has questioned the play calling to start. And I think it was just a slow start and Texas was prepared and K-State didn't have what they were ready for. So they had to make an adjustment, but when they did, Will Howard came alive and he, that pick should not be on him. I mean, he threw a great ball to Jace Brown that should have continued to energize K-State coming out of the half when it felt like they were making some headway there. And unfortunately they gave it right back, but he put his head down and went back to work, kept grinding. Uh, So what do we make of, the quarterback usage, and then how Will Howard played today. Drew, you can start off for us. Uh, for usage, I, I think that what they did was probably the way to go. It looked pretty evident in the first two, or I guess the only two drives that uh, Avery Johnson was in, that it just wasn't going to be an Avery Johnson game. Uh, they, Texas was selling out to stop the run, where the QB run, I think that he had, he got blown up right away as well. So, I mean... Will Howard gave them the best chance to win today. And I, I think that there's no real argument for the other side. Uh, that's a career high in yards passing for Will Howard. It's four touchdowns. It, it's just, it's, it's frustrating of how it all happened. Because like you said, like, in like we've said many times, it all happened just right at once. I mean, uh, three touchdowns, three touchdown passes and four plays at one point for Will Howard today. So you you would like more consistency, but I think that's more of just like what we've talked about with the offensive struggles more than anything else. Yeah, I, I think it was just a matter of finding the rhythm. Um, I, I obviously think the the early part of the game when they weren't having much success throwing it, they found the the rhythm was not there, um, even in the passing game. And then it, it, all it takes is one play. That, I mean, there was a big twenty eight yard play af- right after the the blocked kick that we recovered that kind of got us going. And that, that really, I think kind of set the tone for the rest of the game. Cause after that, um, the final 38 pass calls, um, had a 55% success rate after those first 10 had a 10% success rate. So that's pretty good. Also over eight yards per play on those pass plays that were calls. So that includes sacks. So it was nice to see that. Also you have, you know, you have basically four receivers with, 70 yards each. Uh, Senate was at 69. Johnson had 70. Brooks had 76. And Brown had 77. So spreading the ball ball around, all, all those guys had at least four catches. So really good job of, of finding different people in different parts of the field. Um, and 
I, I think it's also a sign of all four of them probably together being the most healthy they've been at the same point this season. Um, I think that played a factor as well. So good to see. I think it, it's good moving forward against the, the teams we have left on the schedule and then whatever happens after that. So uh, hopefully um, this is a sign that they can finish uh, the season well. I know I think there's going to be a mindset from some people of, well, we're not going to the Big 12 championship game, so let's play for next season. I don't I don't really think that's fair for the rest of the players on the team. Um, I, I get that sentiment, um, but I, I do think um, you, you stick with – you probably stick with Howard unless he gets hurt or has a really bad game again and uh, have packages for, for Avery to, to come in and – and be a part because obviously he's been in the red shirt. You might as well use him. So, so how Klein's going to balance that the rest of the way will be interesting to see. But I think this is Howard's team to finish the season and the bowl game. I thought I thought that even at one point in this game, because I, I mean I, I've I've said that earlier. I think I said it after um, like the Texas Tech game. Even that look, I, I I've thought all along that K State the the peak of what they could do this season. It could be. It would only be achieved with Will Howard at quarterback. I just didn't have the full confidence that we were going to see that again because Will Howard, so many times in his career, has either been beaten down by fans, media, or himself in some way. Like I think, certainly the first two years, it wasn't just the people on the outside that were beating Will Howard down. He had to have been beating himself down on the inside, starting to think like, "Man, am I am I really this bad? Like, how can it be?" And I think it took a guy like Adrian Martinez being right there with him to number one, light a fire into him where, you know, a, a guy that's been in the program for two years, has all that experience probably feels like, okay, most situations I should, this should have been my job from the get in 2022. Like I should have been the guy. I have all this experience, all this, but they didn't think I was good enough. That probably drives him. And then he has the right guy that went through his own struggles to kind of explain like, Hey, look, because I guarantee you there were times where Adrian Martinez thought that everything that went wrong was his fault. And then he can probably say, you know, a little quietly, just be like, hey, look, at Nebraska, I really didn't have great receivers. You want to look around your receiver room? Like, you think these Bill Snyder recruited receivers are really that good for you? I mean, Dalton Schoen was really good for what he was. Dalton Schoen happened to be, you know, a number one receiver like that that first year of climbing was kind of an, an example of where K-State was. Unfortunately, Malik Knowles was a little bit better uh, than that, and, and K-State pieced it together. But the cupboard was pretty bare for what Will Howard had to work with. So there were other things out of his control that he was not at fault for, although he was not fault-free. And so I thought that because of all that, like there was a chance that he might just shut down in terms of not being able to, to recapture it and get it back. I mean, we see it all the time in different sports where – Guys are right up here at the top, and they just crash and burn, and it never comes back. Golfers, it happens to. I mean, David Duvall is the one that's probably the best to point out. Like, he was right up there, top of the world, battling with Tiger and Phil, and then, boom, he's gone like that. Tiger and Phil go on to keep playing for another, you know, 15 years at a really high level. And, you know, we see it in baseball. Guys that are pitchers, they can't pitch anymore. Guys that are hitters can't hit anymore, and it, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, Chris Davis was smoking balls out of Camden Yards, and all of a sudden he's the guy that everybody laughs at for two straight years because he can't get a hit. So I, I think that's where the, the thought with Will Howard was, and that's why I was you know, in the boat of saying, hey, if it doesn't come back and once they get out of the Big 12 title race, hand this over to Avery Johnson and, and see where you go. The different thing, though, that changes the mindset on that is that Will Howard's not the problem and he hasn't played bad or even like, you know, below average the last few weeks. He has been good against TCU and Houston and Texas. And he didn't, he doesn't deserve to lose his job because it is still his job. And I'm with you, fan. Like nine and three is still on the table for this team in the regular season. They can get that 10th win in the bowl game. Like, that's still a big, big, big accomplishment. I mean, think of how many 10 wins there are, seasons there are in K-State history. There aren't a ton of them, despite what people may think and feel like. And I, I think that you still let Will Howard go and and let it keep going. And obviously, you know, yeah, if things go south, you can hand it over to Avery Johnson at some point. He absolutely should still be used in some way. Um, even today, like, 
I get what they were doing, but it's not the craziest thing that has tried and given Avery like one play in overtime even, because that's the situation that I wish that they would be a little bit more aggressive in Avery Johnson's usage where I get it. Hey, it's this guy's drive. He got you down there. You don't want to take anybody's confidence away, but Avery Johnson's skill set lends itself to being really good deep into the red zone. At least give him one opportunity there. Uh, and even if you think it's predictable, then then throw. I mean, Avery Johnson showed over the last two weeks he can throw the football if you give him the chance to do so. And they they didn't let Avery throw the ball today. I mean, everybody's questioning that decision. So I just think you let Will Howard keep doing this because uh, you he deserves it. He's earned it. He's playing well enough for it. Uh, and he's not playing like a guy right now that deserves to lose his job. And if he can go out there and rip you off four more wins, it's a good way to send him out because I know people are having this conversation on the board. Next year's decision is a totally different deal than this one. Next year, I am I am heavily in the boat that it should probably be Avery Johnson time. I mean, Will Howard's been here four years. It's going to feel like it's been an eternity. People get fatigued. And even though Skylar Thompson kind of went out on a high note, it just felt like the guy was around for far too long. And I think that it's time to make the switch. Avery Johnson obviously has all this talent. He's going to get a full offseason to get better, be prepared. And then you hopefully have three years with him as your guy and you move on to the future. But for the rest of 2023, unless things go horribly wrong, like Stillwater, Oklahoma wrong, Will Howard should be the quarterback at Kansas State the rest of the year. And I, I don't think that anybody should question that. And if you do, I think you're just being harsh and unfair at this point to Will Howard. And you have something against him you don't really care what's best for K-State and the rest of the team in this moment. I, I'll, I'll add to this kind of with the passing game and just total kind of Will Howard discussion. K-State might have found something with, J, something with Jace Brown. He had a, a, another good game today. He's averaging 17 and a half yards a catch. He's adding an explosiveness that we've, that we've been waiting for. And, and it's nice to see him kind of coming along too. And that, that makes you kind of get excited about not just the future like next year, but kind of down the line. I mean, I think now after this game, he'll be at like 210 yards receiving. And if, if you keep in mind like how often he's played, it, it's not crazy to think that he could really take off, not just the rest of the season, but next year even. Well, and real quick, I think that's another reason why Will Howard deserves this shot and this opportunity moving forward is because it feels like for the first time all season over the last few games, there are starting to be actual receivers and threats to work with in the passing game. Where early in the year, I mean, Will was having to do it with just not a lot going for him. But Jace Brown has clearly emerged. Phillip Brooks, really since the Texas Tech game, he's doing things that we've never seen him do in his career. He's going up and getting balls. I mean, he's finding himself wide open for balls down the field in the end zone and, and all this. And then, uh, you know, Keegan Johnson, despite the drop ball early in the in the, the second half that made you want to freak out. And, you know, I, I <laughs> talked about how wildly disappointing he's been, and that is a fair assessment. He has been wildly disappointing based on what he was built up to be. but. The rest of the game was good, and it showed flashes of what we had kind of assumed, that if you get the ball in his hands, he can do something. They found ways to do that today. And so for the first time all year, the quarterback has more than just Ben Sennett to get the ball to in the passing game. You have guys that are actually making plays for you, and that is a significant thing for K-State. And the, the benefit is, is that you know all of those guys you know outside of Brooks they could be back next year now i don't know that Senate will be cuz the the nfl seems like a a likely destination for him but the fact that you're going to have brown and johnson next year and it seems like the you know, corner has been turned there that's good and the receiving group that like that recruiting is going to continue to get better now that these guys see they can actually be utilized in the offense of Colin Klein versus what it was under Courtney Messingham. And you hope if you're K-State that you're finally going to have some continuity at that that position coach uh, spot because you've just been a rotating door there. So I think that's another thing to take into consideration in all this is Will Howard finally has weapons that are working as true weapons. You know, it's it's not like in the other guys when Will Farrell does the desk pop and they take his gun and they give him the wooden gun. It's like you can only do so much with a wooden gun. Give him the real thing. 
Will Howard finally doesn't have a wooden gun back there. He can actually, you know, make some people pay. So uh, I, I think that it's a it's a good thing right now for K State, at least in that term. And I mean, that's one of the positives moving forward. Which um, I was going to say we were talking about the mistakes and some of the other stuff here, but I feel like we've gotten to a pretty positive point in this. So let's <laughs> focus big picture moving forward. There are four games left on the season for K State. Three regular season games. Two of them very important against KU and Iowa State games that, boy, if you think a meltdown and a three-point overtime loss at <laughs> a top-10 team is bad, Chris Kleiman and the boys, try losing in Lawrence or against Iowa State this year and see what happens. So uh, big picture, what's next for K-State? What are the expectations over these final four games and really the next three that kind of dictate what that fourth game ends up looking like and meaning? I, I think, I think clearly – even uh, KU will be a, a significant challenge playing well tonight against its Iowa State. Um, uh, Iowa State could be somewhat of a challenge, although I think we're seeing kind of what they're about right now. And I, I think Baylor's awful. Even though they have three Big 12 wins somehow, I think they're terrible. So um, I do think next week does have a high likelihood of being one of those kind of let down, ugly games that probably stays closer than we'd like it to be. Uh, for a while, but I do think if if we lose the Baylor, there will be justifiable ma- meltdowns all over the place from the K State fans. I, I won't even try to put a stop to those. I can't spin that one. But um, <clears throat> then KU coming up after that in Lawrence will be will be a battle. I think it's going to be the most significant KU K State game in since maybe 1995 when both teams were ranked. Um, to th- or some of those 2000, a couple of those Prince year games, both teams were in decent shape when they played. Uh, but uh, that, that that's going to be something to watch for, for sure. All right, Drew, before you go, let me set you up here because I told you I would do it. Is the K-State football season over after this loss in Austin? <laughs> uh, no, it is not. Uh, I mean, you look at the three games and I mean, all, all three are – I don't want to say extremely winnable, but K State will be favored in two of them, and the KU line will probably be pretty close to a pick. Yeah, I mean, you, you you win those three, and then you have a chance to win the bowl game. And you said, look at how many ten win seasons uh, K State's had before. Well, I I did some homework uh, to try and calm the, calm some people down and calm myself down a little bit. Uh, if K State wins uh, these next three, then wins the bowl game. K-State hasn't won 10-plus games in back-to-back seasons since 2011 and 2012, and it's only happened four times in the history of the school. So, I mean, you still have a lot to play for. So, like, yes, this loss sucks, but yes, Texas is also really, really good. I mean, that, that that's the best team K-State's played all year. Um, so the season's still right there in front of them. I mean, you, we can flash back to last year, K-State loses Texas, by one score, falls six and three and four and two in the Big Twelve, and then you, if you win out, you let the chips fall where they may. And if you don't make it to Arlington by going seven and two, I mean that that's just kind of and oh well, like that just sucks, but it happens. Yeah, I mean I agree with that. Look, K State could end up playing an identical season basically to what they did last year. And it's going to feel like they were wildly short of Arlington. And last year they made it there and they won the thing. Um, I mean, there's still a lot here. And the season is certainly not over, especially since, I mean, emotionally those games against KU and Iowa State are going to mean so much and have a lot of bearing on how the season is viewed. Because, I mean, we know how fans and people react to everything. K-State could have won this Texas game and by doing so, probably survived another loss and still made it to Arlington. But if that loss was the KU, everybody would have felt like the season was a lost cause anyways, because uh, that's the game that that really matters. I mean, the other games matter, and you want to have a respectable record and not look like an average team, but you want to look like a good team that also has a win against KU, and that streak means something to K-State. And so all the stuff that was going to be important is right in front of you. Now, I don't envision we get – Chris Kleiman saying that, you know, on Tuesday that a Big 12 championship was never his goal, not his goal. Uh, So I don't (laughs) think that's going to come, but there is still a lot more than just that to play for. And we'll have to kind of wait and see uh, 
where things go for K State and and what lies out there with these next three games. I Baylor is just so bad, and this team has been good in terms of how they have responded after you know a loss, and then also um, being able to take care of business against the teams that they should. Having it at home, I think that helps, and so I'm I am of the opinion that next week. Well, maybe it's closer than people want, as in it's not going to be 41 to nothing again in a home game against a bad team. I do think that K-State goes out there and they handle things pretty easily because the thing that would maybe concern you the most is that K-State gives up some points to Baylor. I just, I've seen nothing that makes me think Baylor can score on anybody not named UCF. And I know that they made a little bit of a push there late against Houston, but it also took overtime. So I'm not overly concerned about the the Baylor game and how K-State will come out because I think the one thing that needs to be reminded to this team all week, and I think afterwards we've seen it with how Ben Sennett talked and some of the other guys, but it, it needs to probably be um, reminded to these players quite a bit is the way you played, you're still a really good football team. And despite all the shortcomings this year and how much that stinks, you're a good football team and just go out and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Make sure that over the next three, you don't put yourself in a position to walk away from another one score game where you had the ball at the end of the game with a chance to either secure the win at Missouri or come back and either win or force a tie like Oklahoma State and Texas. Don't don't leave yourself more questions and do that by just keeping on remembering that you're a good football team. I'll add in, uh, too, that it, it's similar to last year where Casey loses at Texas. And then the next week they play Baylor in what could be a letdown spot in case they blew the doors off of Baylor sure. in the same spot last year. Uh, Chris Kleiman teams are really good with their packs against the wall. And I mean, I, I expect them to come out ready to ready to roll next Saturday. Yeah, I think so. Uh, when, when, when do we think we get a game time tonight for that one? Never. They're, <laughs> they're going to announce it on Friday. <laughs> That well, that would really, you know, as long as they they announce it for a good time on Friday, that'll be fun. I'll already be up there for basketball, so uh, I am at least pleased on that scheduling this year. Home opener for basketball Friday night, home football game the next day. That's nice. I just it, want it to be an 11 a.m. football game then the next day, so I'm not there all day Saturday with nothing to do, that, that, sitting that, in my brother's house that I went <laughs> to college in, and just nothing to do because I'm surrounded by people I don't know or care to interact with the, the turnaround of immediately having a basketball game though on monday is kind of brutal yeah that'll be that'll be a fun fun time all right uh let's let's roll on real quick i i gotta say it because you know if we don't talk about it in this game it feels like we're not doing our our due diligence with assessing the game uh the offensive line they they did have some poor play today uh some guys made some crucial mistakes at various points uh, what do we make of what the offensive line is? And do we just have to accept that they're going to go through stretches where they're fine. They look like what was promised. And at other times they're just not going to be able to make the, make enough plays that you need to have the time to beat a team like Texas. Cause I think that was the thing that was biggest today is the offensive line just wasn't good enough to handle Texas for 60 plus minutes. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I, I think pr- part of me was shocked some because I thought they played, even though we weren't good, I thought they played better against Alabama's defensive line in the bowl game. It's pretty much the same group of people against a defensive line that is about the same talent level. So so I did not expect there to be zero running lanes. And, you know, I think our longest run was eight yards all day. So, I mean, I, I expected there to be a few more – significant runs and more success in the running game. So, but I I think they'll recover fine. I think, you know, they're facing some defensive lines the next few weeks um, that they should be able to find success with and and get back to running the ball a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Jimmy kind of hit it on the head. I was going to say, even though I thought, even though K-State lost that game last year, that they played a lot better against Texas even last Mm -hmm. year than they did. (coughs) And that, that's, that's almost the exact same sex defensive line, too. True. Uh, kind of a, a weird thing. I was looking at Baylor and Houston, what the final numbers ended up being today. Uh, Houston didn't put up a ton of yardage in the game. 
uh, despite scoring 25, but eight of that came at overtime. So really, they they scored 17 points in the game. So I was um, a psycho and had that on us as a second screen today. <laughs> I was uh, I after the K State game, I I gave the TV up to to my wife and anything I needed <laughs> to watch, I was going to watch on my phone for a little bit. Um, but looking around at what Baylor has done this year and just kind of how things have played out for them, um, Iowa State ran for 162 on Baylor in Waco. Uh, Eli Sanders had 90 yards, and he's made some nice plays against KU today. Uh, and then they their their second back had 58 yards. Cincinnati went nuts on the ground against Baylor. They had 288 rushing in a loss to the Bears. And then, uh, as you might expect, Taj Brooks had a big day against Baylor. He ran for 170. So this team has been susceptible to the run game when a team – has functioning running backs. We know Houston does not have that. So this does seem like a, a good opportunity for K-State. Honestly, I'm not saying that they have their best offensive output of the year, but it might be the most in tune and meshing offense we see from K-State all season because it feels like the pass game is at its peak right now. And then the opportunity for the run game to get back to usual and have a big day is right there. I mean, for as down as everybody was on Colin Klein through the first you know, 30 some minutes of this game today against Texas. Um, you might be all the way back in and pretty high on him after how things play out against Baylor this coming week. So I I'll just at least insert some more positivity for everybody there. All right. You guys are shaking my head at me. This is, this is growth. This is me <laughs> trying to not just be down and pissed off after a loss for everybody. <laughs> I'm trying to see the good and, Good. I mean, it's good. It's very frustrating. You, everybody should feel like crap after how that game played out today. If you, if you ever step foot in Manhattan and you wear the purple and white and whatever else, you should feel like crap after that. That that game should stick with you and it should hurt because it does. It does hurt. But you can, you should at least be able to see the good that came from it and that this team is playing well despite the ugly start and that there is this opportunity here and. I'm not, I'm not trying to be, you know, the media mouthpiece that Chris Kleiman asked for, what, at one point last year or two years ago. Not doing that. This is just, this is genuine for me, and I, I can see more positives than what I felt like I'd be able to see. And it's probably a good thing that I said we were going to wait until 7.30 at night to record this thing instead of immediately <laughs> after the game. Because I thought I was going to say some really nasty things. I still have some really nasty thoughts in my head, but I'm not going to say them. So we can... uh we can move on unless you guys have any final thoughts from the game. Then we can go into college football outsider. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll add in. I was just talking about Jace Brown and everything. Uh, he is now K-State's fourth leading receiver on the season and didn't really start getting meaningful playing time until the Texas Tech game. So, I mean, I, I, they might have found something there. Only fourth? <laughs> <laughs> All right. College football outsider time. Uh transparency it's 8 45 on saturday night so we still have a game in progress in the big 12 that's Two ku games. and iowa state and as much as it looks like and i assume ku will get the job done iowa state is clinging to life and has a chance here and we know what fourth quarter jason bean can be sometimes uh west virginia is killing byu i was gonna so, say you really discredited byu there by not thinking that they could come back down 30 with five minutes <laughs> left. well there is 20 minutes left in the game so you never know. Um, but outside of that, what do we make of the Big 12 to this point this week? I think, obviously, the big one that steps it out is Bedlam paid off for everybody that's going to be still in the Big 12 a year from now that Oklahoma State was able to get the last laugh on Oklahoma. And it is funny that on the way out, Oklahoma will have failed to beat K-State, KU, and Oklahoma State in their final tries against those schools. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoy I do enjoy that, um, and Bedlam was a pretty good game, ugly game. There was some, you know, I think it got off to a good start, and then there was, like, some ugliness in the middle, and then, you know, Oklahoma State made plays down the stretch to get the win. Um, I think it's it's kind of cool for Oklahoma State. Um, again, Drew and I can go back to apologizing to Mike Gundy and the entire Oklahoma State fan base for how much we trashed him going into our game against them. But they've they've definitely turned that season around, and you know they, they can lose to one of the newbies. They still have to play, but they should be in Arlington playing for a Big Twelve championship. So 
I, I think Mike Gundy deserves a lot of credit for getting him the, to this position for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway is probably Bedlam. Uh, I mean, I will give Oklahoma State a lot of credit for their turning of the season around. But at some point, you have to be like, what was Mike Gundy doing in the first three games? Like, refusing to give the ball. Like, yeah, Ollie, right. Ollie Gordon might be the best running back in the in the country, not just in the Big 12. Yeah. And he had, I think I did the math earlier, it was like he had 19 carries in their first three games combined. It's like, wh- what are you doing if you're Mike Gundy in that situation? Um, I'm going to throw out there that uh, my take about BYU being the worst 5-2 and two team in the country last week looks like that's going to be a thing because I'm not sure if they're going to make a bowl game after starting 5-2, and two, which is very impressive. Uh, uh, real quick, I want to insert my – I will finally fully apologize to Mike Gundy. Oh. So I'm, I, will, I will finally do that for everybody that had been waiting for it. My apologies to Mike Gundy and doubting him and thinking that he had lost it. The man, in fact, still has it, and I will never doubt him again. I, I had my <laughs> doubts about doubting him going into this season, but the evidence was really starting to pile up. And, I, look, I, I am fair to have questioned and blamed him for what he decided to do by playing three different quarterbacks, two of which were completely horrendous, and starting the wrong running back at the beginning of the season. He tried his hardest to prove me right, and it was so bad that he had to be like, all right, we got to do something different. And now it has magically worked out for him. And Oklahoma State should be in the Big 12 title game as long as they don't, you know, lay an egg and poop the bed against three terrible teams. Yeah. I mean, it, it's honestly crazy how their turnaround has gone. And West Virginia is a team that is just kind of there for me. I'm not sure if they're any good, but they're going to be six and three. Yep. And also, shout out to Sonny Dykes because I don't know if they're going to make a bowl game after being in the national championship last year. Yeah, all right. Well, real quick, uh, sound the alert. Sorry, I'm not prepared with audio for this, but I have a graphic ready. So if you're watching on the YouTube, it's time for the first edition of the Big 12 Coach Fraud Tracker, Week 10 edition. (laughs) There are the handsome devils, four of them that have made the list. We are watching them. We are in We are in the uh, Midwest Command Center watching for frauds. And we have a watch issued for Sonny Dykes and Joey McGuire. And boy, some of the posters on KSO are going to be like, what? You're, you're jumping off of Joey McGuire's you-know-what? Uh, yeah, look, uh, some of us bought in pretty heavily to Joey McGuire. They won eight games last year. They were moving in a good direction. Recruiting has been strong. But even with their win against TCU, I didn't like what I saw on Thursday night and how this year has gone. And honestly, <laughs> them winning was probably the worst thing for the Big 12 because as Drew was saying, now the other man joining him in the watch category, Sonny Dykes, <laughs> they both may not make a bowl game. And those are two teams that you would have thought were locks for the Big 12 to go bowling this season. So Sonny Dykes, Joey McGuire, it is watch time for you. Moving up, get ready. Uh, it is coming. It's not as big as a warning, but it's something to be aware of. It might it might get you pretty good if you're not prepared. Brent Venables is a fraud advisory. He was a watch after last week against KU and how it just seemed like poor coaching led to their demise. Boy, not only was it poor coaching of his players, I think Brent Venables, let me let me take this off real quick. I want people to see my face when I say this. I will, I'll put my name under it. I will put my name on this. I think Brent Venables lacks the emotional maturity and intelligence to be a head coach in college football. And we saw that today after the pass interference call later on in the game that was pretty significant anyways for, for Oklahoma State to move the ball. And he goes out there and is just a total idiot and gets a 15-yard penalty on top of it for, you know, unsportsmanlike conduct and getting in the ref's face. Like, I just don't think the guy can handle being a head coach. And when you're a guy that's been that successful as a coordinator for as long as he was and you wait this long to take a job, there are other reasons for why that happens as opposed to just, you know, waiting and waiting for Oklahoma to open up. I just think Brent Venables is not cut out to do this. And I said when he got hired, there were two things that could happen. He was either going to elevate Oklahoma to the level above Lincoln Riley and they could win a national championship or he would take them to lower levels 
And we're seeing that it's going to be lower levels because, as was pointed out to me today, look, you've lost this season to KU and Oklahoma State. Next year on your schedule is going to be well, LSU, Alabama, Ole Miss, like all these teams. If you think you're having a tough time beating these schools, wait until the, the middle of the pack of what you see in the SEC next year looks like it does. Oklahoma's in a tough spot, and honestly, they're fortunate they don't have three losses because if it wasn't for having a, a good quarterback, a competent quarterback this year in Red River, they would have lost that game too. I mean, Red River, we know that the, the, the worst team and the team unqualified to win somehow finds a way to win in most years. That's what happened this year. Texas is the good team that played in that. Oklahoma is not. So Brent Venables, fraud advisory. I don't think it's going to end well. And then the poster boy for the Big 12 coaching <laughs> fraud warnings. It's Dave Aranda. I mean, that son of a gun. I, I kind of love him at this point. He just keeps proving me right. He makes me look like a genius. I've said it all year, and I've said, I've said it for multiple years now. And here we go. I mean, just an awesome showing at home against a Houston team that probably should have just quit at a lot of things, not just football after last week. And Houston found a way to win. And not only that, Houston had the lead and was going to probably – you know, give this game away. And then they still found a way to win in overtime by going for two. I mean, that it takes some stones there. So shout out to Houston for putting Dave Aranda in his place. Uh, those are the big 12 coaching frauds for week 10. There is room still for other guys to make an appearance. And I want to, I want to make note of this real quick. Some of the other guys, they're just not good enough as coaches to even appear on this list. So like Neil Brown, dead man walking, even though he's kind of doing some things. I'm not putting him on there. That's not fair. Uh, Scott Satterfield, he's easily like, you're not even good enough for me to care about you, dude. Like, you don't even, you're not even showing any signs of even being a fraud. You're terrible. So, that's uh, just what I, I have to say there. Can I pull up the graphic uh, just one more time? Yeah, you need, you need me to add somebody? Um, Can we talk about the, the headshots of the bottom three? Dave Aranda's is fine. Brent Venables it looks scary. Yeah. Sonny, Sonny Dykes looks the most like his mascot, I think. <laughs> and Joey McGuire is just looks kind of like a creepy old guy. Well, uh, Joey McGuire looks like snake oil salesman. He looks like a guy that would be a fraud. And then Sonny Dykes looks like a guy that's like, I'm a fraud and I'm getting away with it right now, but I can't believe it. So uh, Dave Aranda also, that might be the only time in Dave Aranda's life that he has smiled because that guy lacks charisma any time I have ever seen him talk, he is one of the strangest dudes that has ever coached football in the Big 12. And I mean, I so I don't get how they got a picture of him smiling there. That kind of blows me away. But yeah, there you go. Big 12 coaching fraud tracker, week 10. It'll be back next week. And maybe we get to add some more names to it. We'll see. Matt Campbell, if Iowa State doesn't get it done, he starts to creep back into watch territory because we'll just need to monitor the situation. It'll be a be a long week in the uh the weather center tracking it down like i'm jay prater or merrill teller or whichever your favorite uh meteorologist growing up was all right uh we've gone on a long time i'm getting texts from my wife asking uh, hoping you're almost done so i'm sure that my daughter's doing something that she needs assistance with it, they've been alone for far too long so let's end this with our one question for next week either chris Kleiman will answer it on tuesday for you or you need to see the cats do it against baylor uh, so what is the one question for next week? We'll start with Drew. Uh, I mean, I'm glad that I always get the, I almost always get the first one because I, I just can just take the obvious one. Uh, how, how does K-State respond? I mean, that that's a tough loss. And it's a game that you invested a lot in and you ferociously came back in. So how, how do you get up off the mat again for the second time? Or I guess you could say third time this season. I will say, how does the uh, specifically the offensive line in the running game respond? And do they go back to the dominant running game and running the ball a lot that we saw the last two weeks, two to three weeks coming into this game, where we ran it about 66, 66 two thirds of the time against Tech, TCU, and Houston? Are they is that going to be the plan against uh, against Baylor, or are they going to try to throw it more and pick up off the success of the passing game? My question, and this one may stretch out a little bit more because the, the game that I'm really thinking we get our answer in is two weeks away, but does the K-State offense 
take off now? Is this the the leaping point for them where we've seen the flashes this year and the flickers and different elements of the offense have been on when the other's been off? It feels like now the opportunity is there for K-State to have a massive week next week where it just think, seems like everything is in perfect harmony with each other. And I really, I really have high optimism for the offense going forward, which sounds crazy to say after it's their worst rushing game of the year. Colin Klein was not very good for chunks of this game. But I really do think that this is a, a big step for K-State. I think they can do it over the last four games. But we'll have to wait and see. And honestly, we may not get it answered until the KU game. And that's, that's the game that it's going to be most important for. Because as we know, KU can score. They can move the ball offensively. You have to be able to keep up with that. And for a time, I was convinced K-State could still do it. I still think they can. But KU's defense is playing slightly better the last couple of weeks, at least preventing teams from scoring at will. Uh, as much as they were early in the year. So K-State's got to be ready for that. But I, I think the offense, as crazy as it sounds, I think they're in for their best three, four-week stretch of the season coming up starting after today. So that's what I'm interested in seeing. Uh, one other note, I called it before the year. It's been on life support a couple of times, but then the doctor said we've made a miraculous comeback. Will Howard gunning for the single-season touchdown passes record. He's back in it, baby. He's sitting at 18 after nine games. So really, I mean, what? We've got four games left for K-State. So uh, only have to basically average like one and a half the rest of the way, and it can happen. I'm going to look like a genius at the end of the year. So it, it, It'll be fun when he breaks that in San Antonio. Yeah. <laughs> or or Memphis. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. I was being positive. I was being positive this show, and I ended it by saying we're going to Liberty Bowl. Uh, I, I'm convinced that it's going to be Orlando for K state because the pop tarts bowl guy, I want, and I want to see him again. I, I've barely <laughs> talked to him, but my one interaction, I kind of like the guy. So I, I would love to see him again. Uh, but I'm convinced that K state ends up there. Although if they went out, they're probably in good shape, except the Alamo bowl would probably prefer Oklahoma over K state. I would imagine if Oklahoma can stay in that position. Yeah. So True. we'll see. But I, you're not going to end up in Memphis. Don't worry about that. Honestly, you win one more game, you avoid Memphis altogether, I'm pretty sure. so. Uh, hey, we've, we've got a one-score game in Ames, by the way. Yes, we do. We do. All right. Uh, last word for everybody. Tell me who wins this game. KU-Iowa State. I'll, I'll, I'll be lame, and I'll say KU. Go, go fighting Matt Campbell's. <laughs> Matt Campbell is not a fraud. 